Welcome back. In this segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about lighting, but a very specific uh, type of lighting that manifests itself from specular reflections. Now, specular reflections are when light strikes a shiny object, a mirror, glass, um, my laptop, my eye, for example. So this, in some ways, is the exact opposite of everything we did in the previous segment, where we were assuming a Lambertian surfaces, where light uh, uh, reflects evenly in all directions. Here we're explicitly going to exploit the mirror reflection of a specularity on the eye. So this is one of the, my favorite cases that I worked on many years ago with the Associated Press. Uh, you may recognize these four hosts from a TV show back um, maybe more than a decade ago now. And this photo landed uh, at the AP as part of a promotional photo. And the photo editor thought something about it looked strange, sent it to, to me, and we started poking around the image a little bit. And one of the things I did almost on a, just, just I, for no real reason, honestly, is um, I was looking at the eyes. And if you look carefully here, you can see in the eye there is a small white dot, which, of course, is the reflection of the light in the room. This is the beautiful thing about the eyes. It's almost philosophical, is that it reflects back to you what that person is seeing. So one small little white dot in the eye. Look at this eye, though. This is from the, second, from the, le from the left here two slightly bigger dots side to side that suggest two lights in the scene. And then this guy's got one bigger, it looks like an extended light source, and then she again has the two light sources side by side. So the fourth and the second seem to be consistent, but the first and the third, something doesn't quite look right. So just qualitatively, we could just stop right here and say, Eyes are great. They reflect back to you information about the world. They often, when particularly in a studio setting like where I am right now in my green screen space, there is light in the room, and you're probably not seeing it because I have diffusers on these lights. But when you don't, and you have your sharp lights or the sun, for example, you will see a reflection. Sometimes you even see a reflection of a window, big square thing on the eye from the window on the side. So the eyes, particularly in high resolution images, reflect back to you qualitatively. If you see differences, significant differences in the appearance of that light, something may be amiss in terms of the lighting in the room. By the way, this is something I've noticed with GAN-generated images, AI-synthesized images or deep fakes, is that the specularity in the eyes often don't match because the GANs don't know about lighting and it doesn't know about 3D geometry and it doesn't know about symmetry. So that's something you can also use for computer-synthesized images. So what's the game we want to play? We want to ask now, not just qualitatively, but quantitatively, given the location of the specularity, can I infer not just how big the light was, how many light sources they were, there were, but where was the light source? So I don't think it'll surprise you to learn that the geometry of specularity is actually relatively straightforward. It's just a reflection, and we've already talked about reflections. So here's the basic geometry. I've got a camera here. I have a light source over here up top, and then an eye in the middle. I'm going to pick a point on the eye, the surface of the eye, where the specularity shows up. I'm going to draw a surface normal from that. That is the red end. Surface normal means I fit a planar patch to the tangent of the surface of the eye. Perpendicular vector goes outwards. That is n. Now, the relationship between the location of the light and the view direction, which is the point in the image going through the camera center out to the world where it strikes the specularity, is determined by the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. That is, the angle between the light direction L and the surface normal N is equal to the angle between the surface normal N and the view direction V. It's very simple geometry. So what that means is that if I know the surface normal and I know the view direction of the camera, then I know where the light is based on the angle of incidence. Those three vectors um, have to have that property. Now, I won't derive this. It's a pretty simple algebraic derivation, but we can write this out algebraically that says that L, the light direction that we care about, is equal to 2 times the dot product between the V vector and the N vector, that quantity times the N vector minus the V vector. So if I can tell you what V is, and I can tell you what N is, both of which, by the way, are non-trivial, well, then I can trivially estimate the light direction. And then if I can estimate the light direction, I can do that for multiple people in an image, um, or even multiple objects, depending on where the reflection or specularity is, and then reason about whether those lights are consistent across the scene. All right, so first things first, not dissimilar to what we did with uh, lighting in the previous segment is we need a 3D model. 
If we're going to talk about 3D surface normals, we need a 3D model. So here's the good news. Um, eyes actually can be modeled pretty nicely. So here's, of course, a, a cross-section of an eye, and here's a cross-section of my model. And a fairly well-established and simple model of an eye is two spheres, one small, one big, that are offset from each other. This, of course, is a cross-section of those spheres. The first sphere, shown in light gray, has a radius for an adult human of 11.5 millimeters. The large sphere, sphere, shown in dark gray, has a radius of 7.8 millimeters, and they are, their centers are offset by 4.7 millimeters. And you can see here that you get somewhat like the shape of an eye. This is a reasonable approximation to the eye. Of course, we only care about that very front surface. I don't care about the back of the eye. I just care where the specularity can show up, and it's going to be somewhere on that front surface. And what's nice about that is that that front surface is a sphere, and if it's a sphere, I know how to get 3D uh, normals from that. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so it seems like we should be in pretty good shape because I've got the, let's see, I've got a 3D model out in the world. I know where the specularity is in the image. I can, t I can draw a ray from there out through the camera center. That's the view direction because that ray must intersect the surface normal. Okay, I got the view direction. I got the surface normal uh, linear combination of those. I'm done. Except there's a little problem here. That view direction, what's the coordinate system of the view direction? It's in the camera coordinate system, right? Because I started in the image and drew a vector out um, through the camera center. But the surface normal is in world coordinates. I don't, I don't know where that is. That's somewhere out in the world. And so now I have a coordinate transformation problem. And by the way, we talked about this in the background segment. The first segment of this class, we talked about when you specify the transformation from world to image, you have to put everything into the same coordinate system. And my view uh, direction and my surface normal now are in different coordinate systems, and I cannot combine them. So I have a little bit of a problem. So we have to do a little bit of camera calibration. So I'm going to model the transformation between the camera and the world using a homography. The homography is an intrinsic matrix. You've seen that already in the background segment. That's the focal length and camera center, times a rigid body transformation, uh, rotation, and translation. Now, you may be wondering here, why don't I have a third column in that extrinsic matrix for the rotation? Why is this a homography? By the way, we'll talk more about homographies in the 3D modeling segment. So this is modeling the transformation between two planar surfaces. Why am I doing that? That is clearly not a planar surface. It's a 3D object. And the reason we're going to do that is because, first of all, full-blown camera calibration is hard. But camera calibration between two planar surfaces is actually a little bit easier. But again, I don't have a planar surface. I have a 3D eye. Ah, but I have that little circle there, which is the boundary of the iris and the white part of your eye is a circle. How do I know it's a circle? Because it's the intersection of those two spheres. Now that circle lives in a plane. So that means I can model the transformation between where that, that specularity is, assuming it is roughly in that plane, and in the image, and this. And now my camera calibration problem has gotten easier because it's only a homography versus a full-blown 3D uh, rigid body transformation. And so the way we're going to estimate this is a little gnarly. It's a nonlinear minimization. I know that this shape in the image should be a circle. It should be a circle with center CX, CY, and radius R. And it's going to image to some ellipsoid. And I know that there is a transformation H homography, because that's now that circle lives in a plane. It images to a plane in the image. And I want to estimate that homography. And I'm going to minimize the difference between the points on the circle in the image, um, the points in the world, which I know the dimensions to because I have a 3D model of the eye. A little bit of a nonlinear optimization, a little messy, but it actually works pretty well. You're basically looking for a homography that transforms a circle into an ellipsoid. That will now tell me the transformation between camera and world coordinates. And now I can get everything I want into a single coordinate system. All right, just to give you a sense of the efficacy of this, we've done a bunch of um, simulations and in the wild calculations. So in the simulations, we again set up a 3D rendering. By the way, 3D rendering is your friend. You've seen it now in almost every segment. Very controlled. You have perfect ground truth. Really good way of assessing efficacy of forensic techniques. So we put a bunch of eyes in the room, put different locations. We move the camera around. We move the light around. We get the specularity. Uh, so all those yellow vectors here are where we move the camera to. Um, I agree, by the way, it's a slightly creepy simulation. 
uh, we fit the 3D models, we figure out the homography, we get the view direction, we get the surface normal, we combine them to get the light direction. In simulation, the average error in estimating the light direction is about two and a half degrees of visual angle. To help calibrate you here, if you hold your fist out at arm's length, that occupies five degrees of visual angle in your visual field. Thumb is about one degree. So when we say two and a half degrees, it's about half your thumb, about two and a half knuckles of visual angle. So what does that mean? It means if the light is within about, let's, call, let's be generous, within a fist uh, length of, of my R of, of, of visual angle, I won't be able to tell them apart. But if one is here and one is here or one is here, I will. So five degrees is not bad. You can actually, that's a pretty small uh, cone of, of uncertainty. Now, obviously, that's in simulation. In the wild, the errors go up a little bit. So we downloaded a whole bunch of images from Flickr. Now, obviously, I don't have ground truth here. We, weren't, we, don't, have any, we don't have any information about these photos. So instead of comparing to ground truth, we looked for internal consistency. So for each eye, for each person, we estimate the light direction. And the, assuming these, of course, are all authentic, no reason not to think that. And then the average error was about six degrees, so a little bit more than a fist length. So within about a fist or so, you can reasonably accurate estimate, reasonably accurately estimate the light direction from the specularity on the eye. Now, back to this photo. Uh, this photo is in fact a composite. Uh, the story went something like the hosts weren't getting along very well. They wouldn't be in a room to take a photograph together. So they came in and photographed each other separately, composited everything together, and shipped the photo off to the AP, which did not publish it because you're not allowed to do that at the Associated Press. Okay, so that's it for this segment. Um, very specific. Uh, so eyes are great. They reflect back to you information in the world. Um, when you can localize the uh, specularity, you can make a qualitative assessment about the size of the light. Is it a small light source? Is it a broad light source? Is it a window, like a square thing? Um, and that's very nice to help you reason about where that image might have been taken. You can quantitatively estimate the direction to the light source, but you have to do a little bit of heavy lifting in terms of the optimization to get that view direction and surface normal into the same coordinate system. Now, there's also some really beautiful work from Srinayar at Columbia University showing that with even reasonably high resolution images, not only will you see a reflection of the light, but you'll see a reflection of what you see in the room. I'm staring at a computer monitor, you can see part of the computer monitor. I'm looking at another individual, you can see that individual. So particularly these days with lots and lots of high-res images, the reflection on the eye can be a very powerful forensic tool to reason about what is not visible in the camera, but is visible to the person in the field of view. Okay, very specific technique, won't work all the time, but like most forensic techniques, it's a nice thing to have in your toolkit of forensic techniques that you can apply in physics-based uh, forensics. All right, that's it for this segment. Uh, we'll wrap it up now and we'll pick it up in a few minutes. See you then.